Good morning. Welcome, students, parents, and colleagues. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here for this convocation ceremony. Legacy. What is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. I wrote some notes at the beginning of a song someone else will sing for me. America, you great unfinished symphony, you sent for me. You let me make a difference, a place where even orphan immigrants can rise up and leave their fingerprints. That passage is from Hamilton, this year's Tony Award-winning musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Students, today we inaugurate your journey at Cornell. As we do so, I want to ask, what new verses or lyrics will you contribute to our great unfinished symphony? You are coming here at an important time, a fraught time, a time when we as a nation and as a world are faced by daunting challenges that require creative, broad-minded approaches to forge a better future. Your journey begins here on the Art Squad. In the seasons to come, you'll spend much time walking these crisscrossing paths, thinking deep thoughts, synthesizing what you learn, pondering your next move, and taking your shot, all while becoming a citizen of the world. This place where you are seated is a point of intersection for Cornell. From this point, by design, your opportunities are endless. We only expect that in return, you go out into the world and make it a better place for all of us. Since Cornell's inception, we have valued both heritage and invention. We learn from what has preceded us while forging paths into an unknown future. In the final days of the American Civil War, just two weeks after the assassination of President Lincoln, the governor of New York signed a bill creating Cornell University. In the midst of the most trying time in our nation's history, two men came together endeavoring to create an institution that would change the face of higher education. Until the formation of Cornell, American college curricula consisted mostly of rote memorization of Latin and Greek texts with a little mathematics thrown in. Students at this time were mainly white, affluent, male, and Christian. After the Civil War, educational reformers began to reinvent the American university. One of the most influential of these was Andrew Dixon White, Cornell's first president. He's sitting behind you here on the Arts Quad. White's vision was for a great non-sectarian university in New York that would welcome all, regardless of color or sex. He imagined a university that would teach not only Latin and Greek, but also, he wrote, great modern literatures, above all our own. It would teach modern history, moral philosophy, and political economy. It would promote science and research, and what was then called the mechanic arts. This was not just new territory for American universities, it was downright revolutionary. White's dream was realized when he teamed up with Ezra Cornell in the early 1860s. Ezra is standing behind me here to your left. Now, Ezra was a true entrepreneur. His wealth came from founding the Western Union Telegraph Company. You are sitting on what was once his farm. Ezra Cornell eventually gave away most of his wealth, 
partnering with New York State to fund Cornell University. That famous quote that defines this institution, any person, any study, that comes from Ezra. Together, Andrew and Ezra offered a radical and inspiring vision of what a great university could be. Now take a look at those statues. It is no coincidence that Andrew and Ezra flank this great intersection of crisscrossing paths here on the Art Squad. Every generation of Cornellians, from the first class to the class of 2020, interprets and extends their vision. In this time, when our collective ideals are challenged, there is no better place to be than right here, right now, where you have the time and space to contemplate who you are and what your future will be. Cornell's story is America's story, and we are in this unfinished symphony together. So what is it about a liberal arts education that equips you with the skills and knowledge to forge a better future? Whether you study philosophy or physics, we call it a liberal arts education because it is an education that liberates the mind from preconceived beliefs and ideas. This education demands that you follow an argument all the way down and that you re-examine commonly accepted truths until you either modify them, reject them, or reaffirm them in new and more nuanced ways. Knowing and examining our heritage is what equips us to see beyond the here and now and to invent the future. It is by standing at the intersection of the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences that you will develop an intellect that is both flexible and inventive. One of our legendary faculty members, astronomer Carl Sagan, deeply appreciated the importance of the liberal arts. He once wrote, quote, it is an exhilarating experience to read poetry and observe its correlation with modern science. Profound scientific thought is hardly a rarity among poets. We see that today. An emeritus professor of chemistry and Nobel laureate, Raoul Hoffman, who happens to also be a poet, and in Lyra Van Cleef and Alice Fulton, both award-winning poets in our creative writing program, who find great inspiration from our scientists who are always standing at the precipice of discovery. Learning for the sake of learning that is, for the pure joy of thinking and exploring, is an example of intrinsic motivation. Now, some might think that instrumental motivation, the desire for fame and fortune, or the urge to get good grades, is what drives success. But research shows that it is intrinsic motivation, the drives of curiosity, creativity, and passion that actually produce the greatest achievements. Now, you may not match your intrinsic motivation to your career ambitions right away. Nobel laureate Toni Morrison, who received her master's in creative writing from this college, had written two books and still did not define herself professionally as a writer, even though one of those books, Sula, had been nominated for the National Book Award. It wasn't until she was writing her third book, Song of Solomon, that she finally acknowledged that writing was central to her life, that it was the place that she found most delighted and most challenged. And of course, it was also the place where she made her most important contributions to humanity.
Now, of course, we all celebrate when achievements lead to accolades and awards, but the moment the pursuit of accolades and awards becomes your primary goal, then your chances for success are diminished. You are here not for our accolades, but to develop and follow your intrinsic motivation. That is where you will find the greatest personal satisfaction. That is where you will make the most profound contributions to our unfinished symphony. One of the great strengths of this college is our uncommon diversity. You have countless paths to choose from and people to study with and learn from who come from all over the world and offer wildly varying perspectives on science, art, and society. The diversity of choice and experience available here is enticing, but it can also be daunting. Many of you sit here today not knowing yet what your major will be. You may be great at economics, but you love neurobiology. You may be passionate about music and hope there's a way to combine that with computer science. By the way, there is. Even among those of you who are certain about your major already, it turns out that about half of you will change your mind by the end of your sophomore year. Why is that a good thing? Because it can lead you to unexpected and rewarding places. As exciting as beginning this journey is, it's going to be a huge transition in your lives. As talented and committed as we know all of you are, you are going to be challenged in ways you have never been before. And it's important to recognize that doubts are normal. All students have such moments. Your advisors, faculty, and peer mentors are here for you. But your job is to be smart enough and proactive enough to seek their counsel, to realize that success often entails working with others and being open to new approaches to learning and problem solving. You know, I can recall a student who came here as a freshman some years ago from a small northeastern town. She'd been a good student in high school, but her freshman year at Cornell was hard. Her grades suffered. She had to adjust to a particularly harsh winter, not unlike the climate of Winterfell. What? No Game of Thrones fans here? Okay, thank you, thank you. But back to my story. Sometimes this student felt like she was in over her head. At one point, she even considered dropping out of Cornell. But she sought counsel from her peers and advisors. She found great courses with faculty like Walter Lefebvre and Carol Greenhouse, who provoked her to think about democracy and justice in new and important ways. She changed her academic focus. She found her stride and she flourished. She went on to graduate with high honors and to get her PhD from MIT. I was that student. And I can tell you that Cornell was a step up for me, but coming to Cornell was one of the best decisions I have ever made. So for those of you who are young, scrappy, and hungry, we want you to take your shot. We want to ignite your passion, your curiosity, and your creativity so you can Write your way to revolution, to be louder than the crack in the bell, to beseech the object of your desire until they fell, to bring a new world into existence, and in the process, 
to write your own deliverance. You see, Cornell is a special place, a place for dreamers and strivers. It is a place that embraces the hungry, the ambitious, no matter where you come from. In the fall of 1950, Cornell welcomed a young Jewish girl from Brooklyn. Her nickname was Kiki, and she was the first in her family to go to college. Her mother had passed away just a few weeks before she came. She was quiet and demure. She was more drawn to books than to parties. But Kiki found her way. She made great friends her freshman year in Clara Dixon Hall. She also met a boy named Marty, who was gregarious, engaging, and most importantly, sweet on her. Then Kiki found a faculty member, Professor Robert Cushman, whose passion for justice and commitment to engaging students inspired her. After Kiki graduated from Cornell with top marks, she married Marty, she went to Harvard and Columbia Law Schools, and she went on to found the ACLU Women's Rights Project. Eventually, she was appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. <clears throat> Kiki is Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, class of 1954. Some of you may know her affectionately as the notorious RBG. I had the privilege of interviewing Justice Ginsburg a couple of years ago. It's great being a dean. One of the highlights of our conversation was when she talked about a modern European literature class that she took with the great writer Vladimir Nabokov, who was a faculty member here for many years. Ginsburg spoke of Nabokov's influence on her writing and said that to this day, she thinks about what she learned from him every time she writes a legal opinion. Imagine that 60 years later, one teacher, one class could have that kind of an impact. Who will inspire you? Who will light your path? What teachers or advisors will help you to figure out who and what you can be? When you walk into your classes next week, next spring, and over the next four years, which of your teachers will be your Vladimir Nabokov, your Robert Cushman, your Carol Greenhouse, your Carl Sagan. You know, there's something special about Cornell that comes from its location. I've worked at many great universities over the course of my career, and none of them provide the sense of community and collaboration that you will find here at Cornell. The geography and climate of this campus can be challenging, Sometimes it may even feel, as Jon Snow might say, like we're north of the wall. <laughs> but it is also a grand, austere, and beautiful place. The campus is ever-changing, bigger than the people who inhabit it, and isolated from the distractions of urban life. It gives you a sense of being present in the world. To look out from the gorges and across Cayuga Lake to the hills beyond inspires an appreciation for the beauty and force of nature. Contending with the elements creates a sense of commonality that contributes to Cornell's egalitarian culture. People here depend on each other and learn from each other in unexpected ways. This sense of connection lives on long past your undergraduate years here. Today, 
and in the days and years to come, take note of your fellow students, those around you today. Your peers are a key part of your education. You will share your learning with them, and out of those shared experiences will grow lifelong friendships. Look around you now. Make eye contact with someone you don't know. When you come back in 30 years to reminisce, what will your friends say about you? What will be your legacy? I have one more story to tell. Then we can get out of the heat. <laughs> it is the story of two brothers from Winona, New Jersey. The older brother, Steve, came to Cornell with a budding interest in geology and astronomy. Once he received his BA in geological sciences in 1978, Steve began his work on a PhD in astronomy. Meanwhile, Steve's younger brother, Tim, arrived on campus, certain he was going to follow in his older brother's footsteps. So as Steve began working towards his PhD under Carl Sagan, Tim declared a major in physics. But Tim grew restless with his studies. On a whim, he decided to take an introduction to film production. That changed everything. Reflecting back later, he said that filmmaking was something I was happy to do 20 hours a day and not sleep, and that was a good thing. Now, if you plan your courses right, you might get a class with Tim's older brother, Professor Stephen Squires. He's still here at Cornell, although he did take time a few years ago to work at NASA's Ames Research Lab. Dr. Squires has participated in a number of planetary spaceflight missions, and he is currently the principal investigator on the Mars rover project. So what happened to Tim Squires? He got his degree in psychology, then continued his work in film. Tim has enjoyed a long creative association with director Ang Lee, having edited 11 of Lee's films including Life of Pi and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, both of which earned him Oscar nominations. I love the story of the Squires brothers because it illustrates so well the opportunities for self-invention and transformation that can come from an arts and sciences education. Think about their story as you start your journey. As you find your path here, I encourage you to be mindful of the great heritage Cornell bequeaths to you, so you may take what you learn to invent a better future. Who among you will help to reweave our frayed civic bonds, help us to imagine new ways to address autism or solve the riddle of what causes Alzheimer's? Who among you will create the poems, plays, and images that reveal our common stake in forging a future that is less divided by income, religion, race, or nationality? Who among you will design new approaches to channel our collective but unorganized desire to address climate change and build a green economy that can scale to replace our dependence on fossil fuels. Cornell's story is America's story. It is the story that Burr tells in Hamilton when he wonders, how does a bastard orphan, son of a whore, and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence, impoverished, in squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. No matter where you come from, we are counting on you to make a difference. Today, you become Cornelians, 
the journey you begin here isn't just about you. It is about the people who brought you here and the people you will meet from this point forward. The other passengers on the ship with you will power your journey. We are planting seeds. We need you now more than ever to be the creative, compassionate leaders of tomorrow. We need your contributions for our country, our world, and for humanity. Cornell's story is America's story. We are in this unfinished symphony together. In closing, I want to say a word to the parents in the audience. As a parent myself, with a daughter and now a son in college, I appreciate what an important moment this is in your lives, as well as the lives of your sons and daughters. Thank you for entrusting us with these outstanding young people. I know how proud you must be of them. We look forward to getting to know them, and I can promise you that we will offer them an excellent education. One last verse from Hamilton. You will come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. If we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll pass it on to you. We'll give the world to you, and you'll blow us all away. Looking out at you now, I have no doubt that over the next four years, 10 years, and 30 years, you will do great things, and you will blow us all away. Best wishes, parents and students, on the journey ahead. Thank you.